Which section did we just get that one? Let's see. Was it two point one? Two point one. I want to say. So the next concept is inverses. And I mean, we've talked about matrix addition. I don't think I've ever said the word matrix subtraction, but you know, you can subtract two matrices just like you add them. We've talked about matrix multiplication. What sort of notably absent from that list is division. Can you divide one matrix by another? And the answer is not really, but sort of. So an ambivalent answer. I guess to motivate all of this, we should observe that we can think of division as really just being multiplication. I mean, if we abandon matrices and just look at real numbers. Seven divided by two can be reframed as a product. It's um, seven times one half. And this two and this one half are multiplicative inverses. That is to say that two times one half is one. Every number except for zero has a multiplicative inverse. And dividing is the same as multiplying by the multiplicative inverse. So we never use the phrase matrix division, but we do have a division like process, which is that a matrix can have a multiplicative inverse, and you can multiply by the multiplicative inverse, and that's basically the same as dividing by that matrix. So, for this section, I may sometimes forget to explicitly say this, but only square matrices can have multiplicative inverses. So two by two, three by three, same number of rows and columns. So B is the inverse. of A if B times A and A times B are both the identity matrix I. Um, in theory, those are two different states. That is, B times A equaling I, and A times B equaling I are two different conditions because, because matrix multiplication isn't commutative. B times A and A times B don't have to be the same. Um, that, that's not really going to, to arise as an issue, but um, 
I did want to point it out, you know. I, the reason I write this equality, b times a equals a times b, is because we don't have that automatically. Um, so if a matrix A has an inverse, it gets written like that, A with a negative sign to the up, I mean, it looks like a power, but it's not a power, it's a kind of awkward notation, but nothing can be done. So, A times A inverse equals the identity, A inverse times A equals the identity. And again, the identity is playing the role of one here. So, when you had numbers, and you were talking about inverses, they multiply together to be one. Here, it doesn't make sense to say that two matrices multiply together to be one, but we have this identity matrix that acts like one. So, not if, I mean, even in, in the space of square matrices where we're working, not every matrix has an inverse. And that's, in a sense, not surprising because not every real number has an inverse. Zero doesn't. But, but there are a lot more matrices matrices that don't have inverses. So with the real numbers, it was just kind of this one number. You could divide by any number except for zero. With matrices, there are a bunch of matrices you can't divide by. That is to say, matrices that don't have inverses. And, I mean, it's not at this moment in time going to be obvious why, but I want to point out that as an example, because I mean, we're used to not being able to divide by zero. So it's easy to think, well, of course, if a matrix has a bunch of zeros in it, we might not be able to divide by that. But A has no matrix. We, again, I'm speaking informally, but we cannot divide by A even though A has no zero entries, even though A is completely non-zero. In one sense, however, most matrices do have inverses. And I mean, that statement shouldn't be taken to be stronger than it is. I mean, you can make these very impressive sounding statements. Like, if you randomly select, if you just generate the matrix completely at random using a random number generator, that matrix is going to have an inverse. I mean, if we're like generating to 16 decimal places or whatever, you could spend the rest of time generating two by two matrices at random, and every single one of them is going to have an inverse. 
But of course, statements like that are a little deceptive because, you know, the matrices we work with in real applications aren't generated at random. They come from various processes, and those processes sometimes do create uninvertible matrices. That being said, um, what I just said about most matrices having inverses does explain the following bit of terminology. A matrix with no inverse is called singular. And I mean, in English, a singular event is like a once in a lifetime or a very rare event. So this terminology comes from the fact that it's very, in one sense, very rare for matrices not to have inverses. And If we've seen a non, if we've seen singular, we can probably deduce what non singular means. It feel it's always felt to me a bit like like there's something very weird about this terminology, like the rare property gets the name and the common property has the non stuck in front of it. It feels like that's sort of reversed from what it should be, but again, that's just sort of how it worked out historically. Um, to, to drill down on this statement, I'm going to give you a formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix. And I don't want you to memorize this formula. Students have been being forced to memorize this for decades and then have never used it for anything. It's not useful in that way. What it's useful for is as an illustration of why I say that most matrices have inverses, but some of them don't. So there's the formula. It's got scalar multiplication and it's got division. And I mean, that division is fine. There are scalars. We're just dividing real numbers by other real numbers. And you can look at this formula and see when a matrix might not have an inverse, I mean, what would stop this matrix A from being invertible? Uh, one minus one to get zero. Yeah, yeah, that's, you're tying this back to that earlier example. Um, if that were equal to zero, you would have a division by zero error, and this formula would break. And the matrix would not have an inverse in that case. And that's why I was able to confidently assert 
that this matrix has no inverse. What we're doing in the formula is multiplying the diagonal elements, multiplying the anti-diagonal elements, and subtracting them. So this formula doesn't need to be memorized, but this is an idea we're going to come back to. That you can take a square matrix and you can assign it a number. And the matrix will have an inverse except when that number is zero. And I mean, going back to what I said about the random number generator, I mean, if A, D, B, and C are being, say, generated up to a hundred decimal places, what are the prob what what are the odds that we generate A, we generate D, we generate B, we generate C? and we perform this operation and we get zero, they're negligible. So, so most uh, matrices do have inverses. Let's see. And I think these have all been kind of introductory comments. They're good comments to make on uh, a Thursday when you're not going to have time to finish the entire section. When we come back on Tuesday, we can ask more concrete questions. You know, how do you find an inverse? Stuff like that. Test is on Thursday of next week. Go get you uh, dig up an old test and throw it on Canvas for you. So. Let's see what they're like.